Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 592. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and today is April 24th, 2020. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us on Friday. Um, you survived, and you're surviving the pandemic, and uh, we're, we're here praying for you. Keep praying for us. Um, another day has gone by. Another week has gone by. I think we're six and a half weeks into this uh, lockdown, depending on what state you're in and what country you're in. Uh, obviously, they locked down parts of Europe sooner than here in America. Before we get too far into this, please like this program, share this program, comment. We'd love to read all your comments in the comment section. Uh, subscribe if you've not subscribed yet. You do that by clicking the little red rectangle and then the bell that pops up next to it. And if you really don't want to watch two guys talking to you on screen, we have a podcast. You don't have to see us at all. You can uh, find the link to the podcast in the show notes. So in a pandemic, the church is asked to respond in many different ways. First, tell us we're not being judged and uh, tell us uh, uh, that uh, God still loves us. Tell us how we're going to partake in the Eucharist. And I think we've discussed three or four times uh, exactly what different churches and provinces and uh, denominations are doing around the world. And I found somebody has taken and gone a bridge too far in the Episcopal Church. And I thought we could talk a little bit about this. The Diocese of Western Virginia was having spiritual virtual Eucharist. Western Louisiana. What did I say? West Virginia. You said West Virginia. It's Western Louisiana. (laughs) It's a West something. Okay, (laughs) Western Louisiana had spiritual virtual um, Eucharist, where basically if the bishop is uh, says it's consecrated here. It's consecrated there, in, in your in your kitchen, right? Yes, Jake Owensby, the Bishop of mm-hmm. Western Louisiana, which is uh, Monroe, Alexandria, the western half of Louisiana, north and western mm-hmm. side of the state. Not anywhere near West Virginia. Nope. <laughs> Wrote to his clergy that I think the day after Easter and said. Uh, we need to find ways to basically bring the gift of the sacraments to people at home because of the lockdown order. And one of the things I encourage you to do is to go and televise or film your your communion services. And when you consecrate the bread and wine, tell people beforehand to have their bread and wine at home too. And as you consecrate your bread and wine, theirs will be consecrated as well. And so you would have, in essence, a virtual consecration. Now, this is different from what we saw from the uh, Archbishop of Sydney, Glenn Davies, and even from the Catholic Church, because uh, all three uh, have commended having sermons broadcast online, but only Jake Owensby took it to the extent, and of course, there's been Methodist bishops who've uh, pushed this line as well, but Jake Owensby in the Anglican world said that this consecration by the priest of the elements can take place remotely or virtually over the over the medium of uh, the internet well let's talk this versus roman catholicism in the roman catholic church it's understood that the vicar is taking the eucharist on your behalf anyway he's conducting the sacrifice of the mass and okay and in sydney they believe and they don't promote it yet, but they believe in the lay presidency where a person does not need to be clergy to conduct a Eucharist. What? Well, they, the Sydney Synod on several occasions has endorsed uh, and asked their bishop to archbishop to approve lay presidency, mm-hmm. where a lay person who's doodly trained, uh, <laughs> doodly, doodly trained. Uh, <laughs> What's the word? Well, he's licensed <laughs> by the Archbishop, like a lay Eucharistic minister or lay Eucharistic visitor. He can be licensed to celebrate the sacraments. But here's the difference between Sydney and Rome. Sydney believes in a memorialist, uh, meaning right. do this in memory of me. There's no transubstantiation whatsoever. We're doing this as an agape meal where we're joining together uh, 
brothers and sisters in Christ in celebrating and remembering memorially, symbolically, Christ's uh, death on the cross for our behalf, it, the Last Supper and Christ's death. We're doing, we're following what he says, do this in memory of me. Um, and it uh, has a long, the Sydney approach has a long history um, in, 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 in the uh, Protestant world, going back to uh, Huldrych Zwingli, the Swiss reformer, who said that, you know, uh, when Christ said, this is my body, it does not, he didn't actually mean it the way Roman Catholics mean it, meaning this bread is my physical body. You can't see it, but it's changed uh, inwardly, but it's still outwardly bread. Because, you know, would, would uh, when Christ said, I am the vine, does that mean he's a piece of wood? In other words, for Zwingli, these words in the scriptures were metaphorical and symbolic rather than literal. And so I'm not saying the Sydney um, is purely Zwingli, but there's a long debate of several hundred years behind this. And the Catholics, have, of course, have their own, you know, transubstantiation views where uh, I don't want to go re recount Too far into reality, it. <laughs> but what Jake Owensby did is take it to a third level of having a Catholic, semi-Catholic understanding of that this is the body and blood of Christ, more than just a memorial, but not quite transubstantiation, consubst almost a Lutheran view of, concept of the real presence, the consubstantiation, but it can take place across the internet between uh, just as so in other words he's got sort of a meld between the two and of course uh i can't say something vulgar but something hit the fan <laughs> well, well hold on a second i can't believe that this is the line in the sand the in the last 60 years they've deposed 700 uh clergy they have uh instituted reforms that no other Anglican or Roman Catholic uh, uh, doctrinists would find comfortable at all. They have women priests, women bishops. Um, what are the other reforms? The, the sexual reforms within the church. Uh, and, and now they're lying in the sand is the Eucharist. Well, what does that tell you? That's an interesting point. And that is it because <laughs> sex is so, sex doesn't matter. Therefore, hey, do whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Yeah. It's you know, like, hey, you you, you want to wear a polyester? Uh, you want to wear a plastic collar or a linen collar? Hey, it's up to you. We don't care. No big deal. But you know, when we get to the Eucharist, now we don't know what happens because <laughs> Episcopalians go from a real presence to the memorial approach with everything in between. Well, we're not going to mess with that, but we'll mess with everything else. Or, sex is so important that it must be, and the changes must be imposed, whereas the communion, eh, you know, why mess with something that's not broke? Don't, you know, don't screw around with it. So I don't that's quite know. Well, why, why, what, what I, I, I neglected to mention, Michael Curry, mm -hmm. the presiding bishop, contacted Bishop Owensby. Now, so that means some of his clergy ratted him out. And had a grandfatherly chat with the Bishop of Western Louisiana and five days later the best Bishop of Western Louisiana rescinded his permission and I give full credit to Bishop Owensby because he said the presiding bishop asked me not to do it and said he that the church's rubrics and canons did not permit what I was asking and so Bishop Owensby didn't basically say well I think I'm right anyway he said I'm you know I will I may not agree with this, but I will be dutiful and conform to what has been asked of me. Clearly, it's too innovative. We'll back off, which is, you know, now, I'm glad he did that as well. Now, I, I think we need to mention Bishop Owensby is no rube. He's got a PhD in philosophy and was a professor of philosophy before he went to theolo theological college. He's one of the better educated, brighter members of the House of Bishops, and he has a developed theology that allows him to make this change. However, he saw himself as being under discipline and un subject to the constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church, which he pledged to uphold. And this is totally 
Bishop Owensby's. Now, whether you agree with him or not, I think you need to give him credit for acting with integrity and honesty. Whereas you have these bishops who for years would, uh, the Jack Spongs, well, Jack Spong was a real, was a real, besides being a real nut job, he was a snake. He would ordain gay people, but he would have his assistant, Walter Ryder, do it. Yeah, he wouldn't do it. He would have somebody else do it. Yeah, so he would make the speeches. He would make all the grand pronouncements. He would do all this and that. But then when it actually came time, he'd have Walter Ryder do it, and Ryder was the one who went on trial. Uh, but Owensby, you know, was a stand-up guy in all of this, even if you don't <laughs> agree with him. No. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about, and you're probably on it, you don't know it yet, but there's something called the Lambeth List. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a, a list where people have been blackballed and uh, they've never been brought to trial. They've never uh, had any official uh, pronouncements against them. But if you're on this list, you can't conduct services within the Church of England. Now, you're on a different list. You can't get hired outside of your own diocese because You've been on Anglican TV. <laughs> You're a, a reporter for Anglican Inc. Tell us more about this Lambeth list we learned about. Well, it it came up in the there's an article in the Telegraph earlier this week. Uh, the Telegraph has been the been the newspaper that's been leading the charge on Jonathan Fletcher, the uh, evangelical leader in the Church of England who engaged in some pretty s strange homoerotic behavior. Um spiritual abuse, uh, semi-sexual abuse. And we've discussed this at great length. And it was published and it was announced in the Telegraph that Jonathan Fletcher had been placed on the Lambeth list, meaning he could not serve in the Church of England in a priestly capacity. Now, it didn't go into, t into the weeds. And I think it's important the, that we know what what is in the weeds. It There's always been uh, blacklists. But in 2003, the clergy disciplinary measure of the Church of England laid out that the archbishops of York and Canterbury can have a list, and these are people who are on the list, and the first four categories, A through D, there are people who've been censured, people who've been deposed, people who've resigned their orders, or people who have quit their jobs while an ongoing complaint for misconduct is against them. So there are people who may have had trials. All those categories of people are placed on a list maintained by the archbishops of Canterbury and York, which they circulate to the bishops and say, these guys can't work in this church. Then, then there's category E. Category E says, and for people whose actions may not amount to misconduct, but nonetheless uh, are not worthy, they, they, they shouldn't be in the ministry, we can put people there. Now, this last one, you have a 21-day appeal matter, so Jonathan Fletcher can appeal this, and we don't know if he was if he was hammered on category E or category A through D. Oh, we don't know which category he is. Right. It's, it's something like out of M5. You know? it's like, what? But here's the thing. Um, let's. Why does this happen? Now, we can speculate. Uh, one is it, yeah. they're basically softening them up before they bring him to trial. They're giving him a few swift kicks. They're basically, you know, smacking him around so that he'll plead guilty and get it over with. Or they don't have enough evidence to go to trial. And this is the most that they can ever do to the guy. Well, I thought he'd also timed out that most of these uh, charges uh, occurred so long ago that they can't bring up charges. Some of them, you know, well, I don't know. Because, perhaps. He's right. 77 years old, so it's not like he's looking for a job. But no. it, but he, he before all this, he still had lost. See, a, you can have a permission to officiate. Let's say you're retired and you're, or you're uh, a non-stipendary priest. Um, if you're a vicar or a rector of a parish in a diocese, uh, you have a license tied to your office. So the only way you can get lose that license is if you are subject to a formal tribunal process. If you have a permission to officiate, the bishop can withdraw it. And that's what they did for the uh, gay hospital chaplain uh, who uh, married his uh, civil partner in, against the direct uh, request of his bishop. 
that clergy not engage in same sex, do not become part of a same sex marriage. He lost his permission to officiate. He didn't have to go through a trial. No, there were trials afterwards. He tried in civil court to undo this. But the, the point here is that Fletcher had already lost his permission to officiate, but people didn't either know or care. And he still acted you know, in a priestly capacity, leading retreats as discussion leaders, celebrating uh, funerals uh, as a priest. Now he's been placed on another list, which my guts here, and I have no knowledge, is that our experience of investigating this is we talked to some people. We had victims who wanted to speak out. We talked to people who had left the Church of England were in the AMIE who were victims of Fletcher. Everybody was gotten to. Yeah. I mean, in the first week, all the people, two weeks, all the people we talked to were going to go public. They had all the stories. They were going to give us permission to go uh, public with their stories. And then crickets. And I, I think what's happened is the, the ecclesiastical process. Now, it's still ongoing. But I think the ecclesiastical process has reached the point where we're never going to be able to try this guy and have a charge stick. Uh, it's like the mafia basically <laughs> saying, you didn't see nothing, no how. <laughs> if you <didn't laughs> see, oh, was that was that your leg that I just snapped? Oh, I'm it's sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I think, you know, people who say that the Jeff of Flesher story goes too far into the roots of the church, that he was protected and, and people look the other way, may be true because of the the complete clampdown we had uh, two weeks into this information. So, And we read from time to time, Andrew Greystone is a, is a writer and an activist on this particular issue. Um, the Titus Trust, which is the organization uh, that uh, ran the, uh, the camps, that the boys camps were Jonathan Smythe, who was the abuser back in the uh, 70s and early 80s was settled out of court with three of the victims and they released this press statement saying that you know we've done this and essentially patting themselves on the back and Greystone uh, released a note saying well you know there are hundreds of victims and they've still not owned wow. up to responsibility they've still not made a confession and they're still going forward and basically they settled because the legal costs uh, for the three people that they were dealing with were probably going to rise above the hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand pounds, I think it was, that they were going to pay out. And I got to tell you, Kevin, hundred thousand dollars. Well, let's speak dollars. Hundred thousand sure dollars. That's nuisance money in U.S. litigation. Pay hunts. Pay somebody to go away. Hmm. And so, Greystone's point is that. This is far from being an admission, far from being settlement. It's just a way of buying off and hoping that these people go away or die. Um, so there's no sad. real accounting. There's no real accountability. Mm -hmm. We read uh, that how many years has it been uh, where the Archbishop of Canterbury has uh, not apologized to people who he said he was going to apologize it, to? We're talking years gonna, now. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not going to happen. I mean, at this point, if you're expecting an apology, uh, I will let you know it's it's not going to happen. And I'm sorry for that. If, if, you know? if you're expecting an apology, if you're expecting money, if you're expecting uh -huh. counseling, uh, you get a note on nice stationery. But that is the <laughs> a, most I think it. anybody can expect at this stage. And now that we're in the midst of the coronavirus and we have new crises, I think the church, part of the institutional mind of the church is that well that's yesterday's news let's go forward and with today's crisis today's crisis what a great transition george you do this so well for me i have referred to pope francis many times as my favorite anglican he is now my favorite gnostic anglican pope francis he has declared on uh, um we, we just had earth day which is where the um people who have guilt for polluting and not recycling come out and celebrate earth and the pope said 
the world or the earth will not forgive us for all we've done to it. And I don't know, I don't speak his language, but was he not saying that COVID-19 was from the earth? I don't know. Well, it's a, we it's a hard be, story. We can be nice yeah. and say he was sort of paraphrasing St. Paul, who yeah. said all creation groans in expectation of the return of Christ. Could be he's saying that. Could be the same. Or he could be recreating. Remember that old margarine commercial, uh, don't make fun of Mother Nature or whatever? That's right. <laughs> uh, where Maze with, a, uh, what's his face? William Shatner. We, uh, it depends who you are and how you're hearing it. If you're a mm -hmm. good, solid, happy Roman Francis Catholic, you just hear good thoughts. If you're a crystal gazer Gnostic, who just thinks Greta Thunberg should be the patron saint of the 21st century, you hear the Pope saying that, yes, this is nature's revenge against the earth, against humanity for polluting and destroying the environment. Uh, if, if So, I mean, how Al Gore and Greta Thunberg are going to hear this <laughs> versus how... Uh, a, a traditional Catholic, well, traditional Catholic, probably be incensed anyway at Francis. I, I think they're pretty upset too. So, but I mean, but the, the point is that you know, Francis is not as precise as he could be. It's not a Rowan Williams issue. Rowan Williams, I just didn't understand half the words he just said. I know it sounds <laughs> special and important, but it's not that sort of imprecise. But rather, well, it's it, but, it seems to be weaving around and saying something that appeals to this side, something to that side. It's like on April 4th, he did this thing calling Mary the co-redemptrix once again. And, you that's know, right. that, that's my teeth on edge. But then he backs away saying, well, there is no co-redemptrix, but we'll call Mary the co-redemptrix. So he goes back and forth. Uh, not that it matters what I think on this issue, but... Well, now you make a good point. I, you remember presiding bishop uh, Frank Griswold was the most amazing taking two solid sides on the same issue. He could just go all in. And you would say, did you just, no, wait, no, he didn't. He couldn't, he, nobody's like that. Rowan Williams could take both sides, but you would never know it. <laughs> okay, he's just like, if he... Okay, well, both sides feel good that Rowan just talked, but they, you know, they don't know if he took his side or not. Pope is on somebody's side, but you, you'll never figure out who's. So. And poor Justin Welby does take both sides, but each side hates him. <laughs> That's right. He, he doesn't he have the ability <laughs> to... He'll, he'll tell one thing to people in the liberals, he'll tell one thing to conservatives, Problem is that the conservatives he hear what he says to the liberals. <laughs> the liberals hear what he says to the conservatives, and so we both beat him up. Whereas Frank Griswold, you know, you know, uh, oh, oh my. Uh, something else. Good old days. I mean, that that made for some good news. Um, all right, that's our four stories for this week. And well, uh, no, there is one. I, I do want to. You got another one? Well, yeah. yes, I want to talk. Time, huh? The dog that did that barked in the night. Oh, did that one? Sure. There was no dog that barked in the night. Ah, oh, that's the mystery of the dog. It's the uh, mystery of Silver Blaze for your Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. aficionado. Yeah, sure. yeah. And the point that Sherlock Holmes was trying to make was that something should have happened, and it's telling that nothing happened. Um, in my Episcopal world, in my writing world, I'm seeing statements and stories and articles and devotionals from the Nigerians almost every day, from the Ugandans, the African church, even the Archbishop of Cape Town, who is a liberal, but he's putting out stuff almost every day. The African church is just doing a great job with social media outreach to its people in responding pastorally to COVID-19. Very encouraging stuff they're sending out. It's not just that they're sending out updates and stuff like that. They're being very encouraging and pastoral. Yes. Why well, is God punishing us? What do we do? How do we pray? In other words, I'm not talking about groundbreaking theology, but things that people ask their clergy. Stop doing this. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me. <laughs> and what's the dog who's not barking? 
with very few exceptions, I don't see this happening in the Western Church. Certainly in my diocese, the bishop will send out homilies for Sunday, but there's no sense of any connectedness or pastoral oversight or anything or pastoral care from the, it's certainly not from New York, certainly not from Orlando. I don't think the Church of England as a whole is doing a very good job. The Anglican Church of Canada, the Archbishop is more likely to talk about that terrible mass shooting in Nova Scotia than the uh, pressing concerns of the people uh, about COVID-19. There are exceptions, but the leadership of the Western Church in the Anglican world is doing a pretty poor job right now. No, I I don't see a lot of encouragement coming out of uh, many denominations here in the West. Uh, a lot of them are going to do their struggles. The United Methodist Church was going to have their splitting uh, convention. That didn't occur. And I think they were all planning for something else, and this pandemic was just not on their radar. But we, I have painted with too broad a brush, because I do want to, uh, in the West, I've already... Uh, Shout out, give shout outs, as my children would say, to the Nigerians and the Ugandans. I also want to speak to what uh, Foley Beach has shown himself to be a stand up guy. Uh, mm -hmm. He's done a really good job. He could do more, but he's got a lot on his plate. But compared to everybody else of his level of leadership in the Western world, he's far and away doing a fan best job out there. And he's I, doing yeah. it in a way that. Whether you like his theology or not, he is a really good pastor. This is coming just, loud and clear. He's so genuine. Mm -hmm. I mean, Foley Beach, you get, he's the WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get, you know, and, and he's, he's very genuine. Uh, uh, and he comes across that way on video and in his teaching and in his uh, audio podcast. Uh, and he's also the leader of GAFCON, which uh, should frighten some uh, people over in the Church of England. You've mentioned Julian Dobbs as another ACNA leader. Yeah, he's, uh, uh, as far as bishops who are making cause of this and being public, Julian Dobbs is out on Facebook. I see a couple other bishops out there that are just trying to say, listen, all you know, they're not saying all is well. They're saying, we're learning the new normal. We're going to be communicating through Facebook and social media uh, at this time. So, but in this difficult time, it's a. I'm now speaking of what I want to be rather than what is. <laughs> um, I think Foley Beach is a man whom God created for his this post in this hour. He's really doing a good job, and I can do this by contrasting his performance against that of leaders in other churches and other denominations who are on the same level. No, and I agree. I mean, I remember the struggle uh, at La Trobe uh, that the House of Bishops was having, how do we replace Bob Duncan? You know, where do we go from here? Because if we make the wrong choice now, this is the the days of ACNA are, are numbered. And I think they, you know, they made a good choice. and. It proves itself not just on the leadership of the ACNA level, but on the global level as well. Well, within the Episcopal Church, I mean, there are, you know, like there's the Bishop of Michigan who is, she's on the internet almost every day, every other day, but her takes are social justice, why COVID-19 is bad for uh, blacks and minorities and gays and lesbians and all this and that, and or the environment, you know, which goes off in directions that just have no resonance to people who are not woke. And then you have well-meaning types like Jake Owensby. Well, okay, let, let's try to do something and let's do this. And it didn't really think this through. Uh, but uh, I'll come back again to uh, Foley Beach, his work that's been out there, um, what I've seen, and I've not seen everybody's. And so I apologize if I've overlooked anyone. It's really uplifting, not on a denominational level, but on a purely Christian level. Uh, it's mm -hmm. what I call Billy Graham uh, level evangelism, of reaching across boundaries to uplift and, and strengthen people in their walk. 
So good job, Foley Beach. Yeah, good job. I, I, we're not part of a fan club or anything, but uh, if you form one, send us the newsletter, please. And, and uh, you know, you can send your payment to uh, Anglican yeah, Unscripted right. in Milford, tw- Connecticut. And, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You can use a nice donation. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 592 of Anglican Unscripted.